G'day all, Joel Seach here, Principal Financial Advisor. And Arnie, Tax Professional. Not Chris Arnold, Professional. <laughs> this week I'm going less formal. <laughs> uh, this is Money in the Tank. This week we've got a very exciting episode. Uh, we've got a special guest in, Ross from Colver Constructions, to talk uh, all things subdivision and development uh, and property. And we're going to um, start off with some news on the latest things that have been happening in the world of finance plus some great 50-50 questions and obviously our in-depth discussion with uh, Roscoe. Yeah, and we've got a few Q&As in this week, so keep them coming, guys, because we love them. And I'm going to reveal uh, probably the most controversial poll results yet. So if you like our 50-50s, what's your choice, either or, then please keep engaging on Facebook um, and throw your support behind You know, one of the choices. Uh, we, we enjoy that. And you can get us at the socials, at Money in the Tank, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Enjoy episode 11 all. G'day all, welcome back to episode 11 of Money in the Tank, uh, talking all things personal finance and uh, today more even uh, digging into the real world of property and property development sort of stuff too in real estate. That's it and we've got a few um, good listener submitted 50-50s as I think we touched on. Yeah, that's all right. It's, um, we've got a subject matter expert as well joining Ross. So From uh, Culver Constructions. Culver Constructions. So, uh, you want to introduce yourself, Ross? Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate the invite today. What do you What do you call yourself, Roscoe? Builder slash developer? Developer slash builder? Yeah, property development, residential building. Beauty. Yeah. So we've got uh, Roscoe on as a subject matter expert today to talk uh, just a bit of high-level stuff about you know, some renovation tips or, you know, subdivisions or people starting out and doing something with their blocks. So just, just some um, uh, things that he's learned along the way, along the journey that I think will be great for our listeners to hear about. So And real estate background. But before we jump in, we'll just quickly do the news item. So I want to talk about the Biden administration increasing or potentially increasing capital gains tax in America, which is probably why people would have seen uh, the bottom drop out of the market, especially in US stocks during the week. So I think they're proposing a 39% capital gains tax rate. And when you add that with the state taxes, it comes to approximately 42, 45%. Yeah. And that's the thing that we saw, we talked about last week is you get news items that come out and the market will move from that. So you sort of see, you know, the tech stocks came off because they're sort of a, a you know, high capital gains type area where maybe they're perceived as higher um, income earning individuals will own those stocks. So the market's quite a a volatile beast when it comes to news items that come out that sort of work adversely against what they think. Well, they were saying, look, it's it's postulated that it won't be retrospective, but it's not confirmed. So yeah, people are wondering what to do with their money, especially in America. Like obviously we don't mind too much, but yeah, you're going to see people sell off because they just want the certainty. So absolutely, as we said, uh, always uncertainty creates uh, you know uncertainty in a market and a bit more volatility. The market loves certainty, even though it doesn't happen that often. But uh, <laughs> uh, and I guess the other news item this week is sort of just the property uh, clearance rates that we've seen uh, in Australia and talking more uh, domestically in Victoria, Melbourne. Um, so just sort of seeing uh, a bit about how the clearance rates are quite strong still. Um, we'll delve into that a little bit with Roscoe, um, talking in you know, his real estate background, just sort of chatting about the environment and sort of the heightened sales at the moment and that sort of FOMO topic or how to you know, make an offer during a period like this if you're trying to buy. Um, but yeah, the, the market's been quite hot for property in general in Australia, and I think it boils down to a, a few things with a really low interest rate environment, serviceability has never been better, um, and people's confidence is starting to come back, and also a lot of government stimulus too. So um, yeah, it, it seems like it's not really slowing down a whole lot, but um, we'll definitely delve into a bit more property stuff today. Um, and most importantly, uh, the Melbourne Demons as well. So, um, you know, talking talking, <laughs> talking all things Melbourne Demons, as we said, if we if we keep winning, this, this podcast is just going to slowly transition to a Melbourne Demons podcast. Can I say, Roscoe, in like a fit of passion last night, I told Joel to cancel you because I wanted to do a full Melbourne Demons podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the real thing now. So. Uh, yeah, we, can't, we can't do a Carbon Blues podcast, can we, Roscoe? Yeah. <laughs> not, not yet. So, I'll be free all September this year. So, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, no, so we've cancelled the chalet. Well, Roscoe can take our reservation at the chalet this year. Yeah, you know, you like the snow, mate, you like ski, you can take the chalet reservation, take the range up, just put the chains on. Um, but yeah, the D's are hot, we're looking good, talking flags, lid's off, lid's definitely off now. So, <laughs> it's way uh, off. Yeah, 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 six and over. That's why the voice is a bit raspy for both myself and Arnie. He was yeah. screaming at the game and I was at a, a sports bar watching it, so the voice is a bit shabby. But um, <laughs> hopefully we'll get through today and uh, we sound clear enough for the mic. Well, we might 
jump in, Roscoe. So, you know, we mentioned that Roscoe started in real estate and now you've moved into development. But could I ask, Roscoe, just as off the bat, maybe just talk us through high level how you got into real estate in the first place? I uh, originally got into real estate. A uh, family friend of ours was owned the local real estate office. Um, and, yeah, I finished school, started yeah, higher education, which I wasn't really too sure what I was going to do. And then, um, yeah, just kind of found myself getting into real estate and, um, yeah, kind of started when I was 19 and kind of been involved in it the last 14, 14, 15 years now and, yeah, transitioned more. Initially, when I started in real estate, I was predominantly dealing more with builders and property developers and, yeah, and I just kind of looked at them and thought, well, I... Yeah, then it's nothing too overly complicated and just got to, yeah, kind of learn bits and pieces from them and, and transition into it full time myself. So, well, so what were some of the steps, mate? Like, so you, you, you got your real estate license, you were selling properties, you were dealing with these developers. Mm. I'm, I'm a total noob in this area, so this is genuine. Like, I don't know. What, what do you have to do to then make that step into that world? Like, do you have to become a builder or like, what do you do? Um, well, you don't have to, so some, well, we're talking as, say, just property development alone, you don't have to, like I do handle the building part of it, and also the property development part of it's kind of two parts, but a lot of property developers will just contract builders to handle all their work, um, which is quite common. Um, obviously, I handle both parts of it, so the construction part of it and also the property development part of it. Um, so we've, I guess property development I would yeah I just kind of I started off initially smaller like so what you call a dual lock or, or like a two lot subdivision to start with which is quite common a lot of people will normally start on stuff like that maybe a little bit of renovation and then just build one unit at the rear um, and then transition more into I guess more so multi-unit developments multi-townhouse development so talking about uh, the first one mate taking us back to the old uh, Cambridge Road days back, uh, how many years ago now? Is it a decade, decade ago? Uh, yeah, it's probably 2009, 2010 was. So your first one was just a dual lock or a reno, reno love project that you did and cut your teeth and learned a few skills yeah, along so the was, way? Yeah, my first house, um, just renovation of the existing house. Yep. Um, and then a construction of a single single dwelling unit at the rear. Yep. Um, yeah, I'd done all the renovations myself. I was up kind of working full time in real estate at the time and was doing yeah, all the painting <laughs> myself, all the, all the renovation, a lot of it myself, because I um, yeah, didn't have a lot of capital at the time. And Did you have to reintroduce yourself to your missus each week? Well? <laughs> <laughs> Went home one night after painting the house till about 9.30, she called the police, it was just me getting home from, <laughs> home from str work. So. A stranger in the house. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah. what worked well in those early days? Like what worked well and what didn't work well? Yeah, with the reno, where do, where do you feel like you um, some tips and some traps for the Well, tank? I guess in, in short, the always think with all type of property development and construction, I initially thought it cost me around 50, 50 plus grand, but it ended up being <laughs> upwards towards 80, 80 plus grand, even doing it myself. Um, so I always probably bank on whatever time add at least 20% onwards of how long it's going to take and also cost as well. I'd probably say the same, just work a real like high level contingency plan in there as well. Cause it never, a lot of people probably get caught out with, um, timeframes, how long things take, how much things cost, um, cost blowouts along the way and things like that. So. Mate, speaking of commodity prices, look at how much lumber costs right now, right? If you were planning yeah. six months ago and now you've got to, by the wood or whatever, you yeah, know, you know, yeah. that's the, that whole um, builder grant that the government's introduced. I know a lot of my friends are involved in construction of uh, price jobs and like LVL timber and, and just basic framing timber. Like there's talks of upwards of 15, 20% on some stuff and let alone supply. That's massive, Can't isn't it? Three, six weeks on some basic timber stuff for building houses and that. So. so that's sort of a tip and a trap, isn't it? So you're saying when people are planning, if you're getting into it, be very conservative in your estimates of time and yep. cost and allow like a margin yep. of error. Yep. Yeah. And also we've, I guess, in the property development part of it, like make sure you use like good designers. Um, when I say good designers, ones that probably have a, a big 
like a long track record with that particular council you're dealing in. Um, also like all your consultants along the way, also builders if you're contracting in builders as well that do build a, like within the local area, have a good name in the area. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's yeah. more from a, a, re, a resale standpoint, if you're using an, a reputable builder in the area that's known, that resale could do better to bode well than, say, like a large, big, specky builder yeah, from I, a resale. Yeah, and also that um, you want to know that a builder can deliver on that product because, yep. um, yeah, it can be like a lot of people can get caught out with you could be doing the property development, but the builder can't deliver on their, their end of the agreement, which in turn... Yeah, kind of, of hurts course. both parties. So, so if we think about uh, just um, um, circling back to feasibility, um, when you're doing a feasibility, do you sort of have like a calculator you use? Do you do you work on like market going up, ten market staying neutral, market going down? How do you sort of give yourself that that room there when you when whenever you're working at feasibility, just for the general people, you know, getting yep. to understand, you know, and what what does a percentage of profit you want to try to look like when you're doing a, a, a dual lock or you're doing a subdivision? Yeah, so most property development, um, with the feasibility, I'd always work that you want to achieve 15% return on costs. Yep. Um, that's net of GST, so yep. all excluding GST. Is that just your number, Ross? Sorry to jump in, but is that just your number? Is that like an no, like so, industry accepted number? Well, we've, um, so most lenders will want to see feasibility and they will want to see an, at least 15%, some will hopefully aim for 20%, but they want to see that there's enough profit in the job. Otherwise they won't necessarily, they'll have concerns about lending the money or kind of backing on the project. Yep. Um, so I would kind of target that 15% rain. Um, also as far as like, I guess the template for doing feasibility, depending on what lender you use, they all have their own kind of set template that I'll just kind of input the figures from that. Yep. And then, um, it's always good to have, I guess, the lender have a look over it as a second pair of eyes as well, just to kind of, I guess, verify or, or yep. feel some comfort around those figures. And, and when you're initially looking for the people listening out there, if they're looking at a project, looking to do something, do, they, do you factor in market movement up and down? Do you? Do no, you... never, never factor in market like pre, like capital growth or anything in the marketplace. Like, I hope there is, but or a negative. Do you work on a, if it goes down ten? What no, I always to... work on conservative. Yep. current values today because yep. yeah i've seen a lot of people probably sometimes kind of have the rose colored glasses on and yeah, factor yeah. in capital growth i was wondering if you work in reverse if you stress tested and if you get a downturn you've got to you know yeah i would just work like realistic figures today yep. which hopefully in 12 18 24 months time when the project's complete or achievable in, yep. in the market so yeah great so those, the lenders you were referencing we're just talking like big four or is there specific ones you go to if you're uh, so we've um big fours uh probably the last 12 months with coronavirus really i guess pulled back a lot in the property development space um can be a lot of um like they will want a lot of pre-sales so sometimes like 75 percent 100 percent of debt cover um whereas second tier lenders or private lenders will a lot of, I'd probably say their market share is increasing a lot against the major banks mm -hmm. because um, just being a little bit more flexible in that space, obviously cost the lendings like higher than the big four, but yeah, yeah there is plenty of options within the lending space at the moment. Yeah, great. What project and for the listeners out there, if they're you know looking at um, you know, getting in on, on trying to do a subdivision, if they own a block that's mm -hmm. subdividable or... You know, what's sort of, I guess, some of the main tips you'd, you'd sort of give to say, you know, whether they're looking to renovate or looking to, to do a, um, um, a, an extension out the back? You mentioned some of the professionals you work with. So yeah. what's sort of the, the key contributors you need to... Well, I guess, first of all, um, exploring the potential of the property would probably be like your designers, planning consultants. Yep. Um, so so probably... Like a drafty or an architect? Yeah, architect, drafty. Um, depends on... Like I'd, I'd normally look, like you can look up the planning registry in any particular council just to see what I guess are the main planners that are handling applications in that council. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably mainly speak to maybe two or three of them to find out just to get a, a few opinions on what you think, whether it be... So you put a call into the council and speak to the town planner there and... Yeah, we well can look up the planning register yep. just through the council website. It'll show you the last 
yep. of hundreds of planning applications and, and, and permits being issued, see what planners are handling which, yep. um, and maybe just contact those three. Then they'll give you a bit of an idea. They'll give you initial cost to at least get it to stage of like drawing, planning application. This is the drafty or the architect? Yeah, the architect or drafty. Um, then just get it to a point when you've got a planning permit, then you can, from that stage, then explore cost of construction. If you want to, say, build a project, sell it with a permit, depends on what you so want to do. So planning permit, do you even to get to that point, what would a tanker be looking at in terms of cost to get to a planning permit stage? Um, really depends. If it's just, say, a, a dual lock or a single Yeah, like a two lot, three okay. lot subdivision. Yeah. Could be in the range of fifteen to twenty thousand to get to that point. Just to get a the drafty cost, yeah, all the and, cost yeah. design, initial feature survey, cancel some initial cancel fees, and that. That's and, just to get it up to the planning. Permit. And my rudimentary understanding of that is, once you've got the planning permit, that is not like that's not the same as selling with plans, is it? Yeah. So if you get a permit, you can sell it with that, which kind of de-risks like removes a lot of the risk out of the project if you sell it to a builder or another property developer. Yep. As far as sometimes there can be quite a bit of capital growth, just getting a planning permit approved if it's multi-unit or sometimes people might have inherited a large like family property and, and can get some capital growth just by achieving just a planning permit and mm -hmm. just a value add to the yeah, property. Just yeah, just value add onto the property then, so. Okay, hmm. sorry, we were going through. So you were mentioning so at that point, you've got the plans, dealing with the architects, all the drafties, and then services. So you're going to build it yourself from then on? You working drawings, is that right? Yeah. So once you get the planning permit, you then pretty much have, I guess, which road you want to go down. One is just stop at that stage, speak to local real estate agents, go to market, sell it with the plans and permit. Or the other is then to go get engineering drawings, working drawings, all the drawings needed to pretty much we'll get ready for construction, get a building permit to do mm. the project. Would a builder handle that? Like I know you say you do it yourself for um, us, but would a, would a builder handle all of that? You can, you can also, most of the time the designer you will use will handle like the work in drawings. They'll have contacts for yeah. engineers, saw reports. They can give you quotes on all those items. I'd probably say it'd be better to handle it all, like get the design and handle it that you worked with. And that way you can get it when you go speak with builders for quotes, you've got all the info, you're not, they're not like just guessing on engineering and then waiting to get it done. Yep. And then something could be different and you might've factored in a certain and you estimate mentioned about, price. Um, and you mentioned about builders before, so I thought it's a good segue to ask you for, for the people listening out there and they're looking to build something, whether it's their own principal place or whether it's an investment for a subdivision, what's a good way for them to sort of you know, short, short list three builders, what's sort of some of the key things you want to, you know, try to get, yeah. get them to find out about? Well, I would say, first of all, be very hesitant. Like a lot of builders might have very good marketing brochures and, and good marketing and that, but unless you can go see three homes that they've built and kind of see the quality, see what workmanship it's like, just see a finished product because everything will look amazing on marketing brochures and that. And what's, a, what's a good way, say they go investigate a home, what's some of the, for the people that aren't, have, don't have a trade yeah. background, what's a good thing that stands out about a quality home that you think they should look at? What's sort of something that's, that's key? We can normally kind of just walk in there and straight away, even with no building knowledge, you will start to see just signs of, I guess, poor quality work, um, issues just as far as the, the overall quality goes. but. Like ideally speak to the owner of that home, find out, well, did the they cracks, deliver on their promise, or, yep. cracks, is there, did they tell you time frame? did did they, did they complete in that time frame? It depends on what they want to do. So um, I would, that would probably be my first thing as well. Then I guess you can just drive in your local area, see what builders are probably active in the local area, building in the local area, mm. um, and probably yeah, stick to... I guess those builders that handle the local area rather than some people try and get maybe a builder that's built a lot in the western suburbs to try and build in the east and then they don't have the trades they want to travel yep. and they it can just be a little bit messy that way so. yeah so dealing with all the professionals and the trades how do you do you have a system that you use to manage that do you have a software system managing trades or when you're dealing with all the different professionals 
No, so I would always, most of the time, the initial designer planner you speak with will have their preferred, I guess, consultants they'd regularly like to deal with. So I'd try and, I guess, because a lot of times the designers then working with the engineer, the engineer working with the designer, the designer working with planning consultants and so on. So I'd try and find ones that all kind of regularly work with each other on other projects yep. and, and try and ideally, unless you really have to try and kind of stick with the same consultants throughout yeah. the, all the projects you do. So. Yeah, great tips and great tips around the builders mm -hmm. for one and, and how to find out, go to a home mm -hmm. and try to inspect it and speak to the owner. I think speaking to someone impartial that's the owner of the property would be amazing mm -hmm. if you can chat to someone and say, how did you find mm -hmm. the relationship with the builder? How's the communication? How are you found it, mm -hmm. finding the house now once you've lived in it for a few years? Um, and you can see the house, as you know, you go in and you can get a feel for it, as you said. So I think there's some great tips and also the professionals as well and engaging people that sort of work with each other and um, maybe, you know, uh, seeing who works and operates a lot in the local area, I think is great. Um, so speaking of the local area, Arnie, you're going to ask Roscoe about uh, local council and, and, and dealings with council and how that works. I was going to jump in because I was, yeah, I wanted to know how you interact with council. You mentioned talking about like dealing with the town yeah. planners at council, but uh, how, how do you find interacting with council, Roscoe? Um, council can be <laughs> very difficult at the best of times to deal with. <laughs> um, but I'd, again, probably choose a designer or consultant that deals with council regularly because some people probably don't have the patience. Sometimes with planning can be um, like can be a very long time frame as far as 12, 18, 24 months, sometimes even longer depending on yeah, dealings with cancel because it's never one thing with planning. It's, it's always gray area. There's never a black and white. So, <laughs> no, never cut and dry. Yeah, it's yeah. never cut and dry. So yeah, I always think that you can submit two planning applications that be the exact same thing for a same site, but planner one at cancel will assess it completely different to planner yep. two and, and require different changes or amendments or numerous things. So, so it can be quite interpretive in terms of how, how that works. Um, yeah, so just expanding on the council work, Roscoe. So when you're liaising and dealing with council, you said it can be quite interpretive in terms of mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the back and working with them and, and making adjustments and whatnot. So tell us about like sort of time frames with that when you, you, know, you submit the first plans and yeah. how that works and if you've got to go back and change things and if there's costs associated with that. And then if, if it still doesn't work out with council, what, what yeah. happens then? So I guess as far as timeframes and that go, initially, just if you today decide to, yeah, you want to, I don't know, put a unit at the rear of your home or build three units, whatever, um, it'll probably take initially two, three months just to get all the planning drawings, the surveys, everything ready for cancel. Um, then the initial kind of month or two at cancel will just be like kind of records departments, get the initial application in. And then probably be an additional three to six months, you'll find cancer might require additional information or can be additional like arborist reports, some type of planning changes, just an initial assessment. Do you tend to, um, that always, they always tend to come back with something? There'll always be some type of level of change. <laughs> <laughs> so Just to reset the clock, so to speak. Yeah, so um, then once, Kind of that it can be you get an initial feel of kind of the plan of support from like on the application if if it's leaning towards a permit if it's not what's kind of happening there and for for a person that may not have as much experience um in it as you do will um, the drafty or the architect help you with that you know that sort of initial stage and and, and interpret yeah. for you what cancel yeah to see. so the yeah. the drafty or architect whoever's handling it for you will um yeah give you a I guess like what type of changes might be required. So sometimes it could be like reduction of upper story windows or sometimes it can be reduction of dwelling altogether to hopefully get support by cancel. Um, I guess back to your question, like, so initially when you go into cancel can be anywhere from six to 12 months initially to get a pretty good idea whether or not it's going to get a planning approval or it's going to get refused. So sometimes I guess with refusal then like in Victoria, like the only avenue you go to then is, is can be like VCAT to try and overturn the council's refusal on your planning application, which again, um, isn't always a guarantee. So that can be 
an additional six months or so and, and can come obviously with cost involved, can be initially like a new set of eyes, like a, a VCAT planning consultant will handle it for you. Um, give you an idea of maybe what changes might be required as, as part of VCAT when you kind of lodge yeah, an appeal against the council's decision. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, can hopefully at the end of that VCAT hearing can issue the permit. If not, then it's back to kind of square one again and um, might have to look at yeah different kind of avenues or different plans or changes or, or whatever to, 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 draw yeah, to adjust, yeah, yeah. kind of submit another planning application and, and start again. And just a quick thought that came to mind. So if you're just doing, like for a listener out there that's got a principal place and they just wanted to do a renovation to their home, mm. it's a lot less rigmarole, isn't it, when you're dealing with just a reno, getting a permit for that? Yeah, so generally, normally, I guess statistically, the bigger the project, normally, whether it be as far as height or dwellings, will lead to sometimes more, like, more like appeals or objectors at cancel, which um, can... I guess, increase the time frame. Because the neighbours can object, can't they? Too? Yeah, it can be yeah. neighbours objecting. Um, normally, like the bigger the project can need to extra planning requirements or planning controls or, mm. yeah, with cancels. So, yeah, 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 the renovation usually, if it's a cut, like a gazebo or a, or a veranda or something, it's usually a little bit easier. Yeah, normally with a basic renovation or small an ex extension maybe or renovation can be yeah, very... I guess quick and easy through cancel. Normally, yep. I guess initial initial dwellings not changing at all. Um, so they're, they're normally pretty supportive of that and okay. normally have a very high percentage chance of yeah. getting approval. And like, yeah. anecdotally, how often do you see one rejected by cancel, Rossi? Like, is that um, so? Normally, thing? most good designers, planning consultants should be kind of upwards of 90% yep. planning approvals. So without having to go to VCAT. Yeah. So we, I guess for your listeners, if they were choosing a planning and so on, I'd find out what their percentage like is of, of getting planning approval. Um, because sometimes initially when you might be selecting a designer, some might promise you maybe an extra dwelling or an extra something or, or make it sound a little bit better. And then you find out that, yeah, they're statistically only getting permits 60% of the time. And there's a lot tip. just, yeah. you might be up for 10, 20, 30,000 and, and 12 tip. months of your time just yeah. to kind of, yeah, be back to square one again. And then mm. you might think, oh, I'll go to VCAT and try to get a permit. But all of a sudden that planner might say, well, there's kind of no chance. I've seen it happen where people sometimes have used a, a, a designer that doesn't handle that local area, probably don't really know the the rules of that area and and it sometimes can be issues. And the other thing as well, sorry to cut you off, Arm, is uh, you might have three designers and one's, you know, let's say hypothetically 10 grand, the other's 12, one's 14. And you potentially, if you go for the cheaper one without doing that research, just because on paper mm. it seems like they're giving you the same deal, but that mm. maybe that 14 grand one is has a lot better strike rate, knows the council a lot better and can get things through at a higher rate Hmm. which would then that stop that flow and effect occurring, which hmm. can cost you an arm and a leg with time and money and VCAT and compulsory conferences. I was, I was going to say, because anecdotally in my council, I know there's a rule or a preference, I should say, it's not a rule, but uh, there's a preference to not have garages like built on the front of the property. So you're yeah. like, and uh, there's weird quirks in each council, right? So yeah. that's what you're saying. Like go with someone who's got the knowledge and the experience. And what Joel is yeah. saying is correct. Like if they cost yeah. a bit more, it's probably why. Yeah, <laughs> a, a good designer that regularly has experience with that local council and they will get you a better permit and that can be well, upwards of tens of thousands of dollars like value add just on that property just yeah. by having a better permit than yep. you know it can be like not as good designs or it could be even a dwelling less if it's multi dwelling like mm. layouts so. and i think in a future podcast we'll definitely get on a town planner to sort of talk more about that planning permit process and mm. what to look you know what to look at in a site and how different residential codes work um you know just just at a high level to give people mm. an understanding about different um you know overlays in, in victoria oh. more, more specifically about we that. should bring roscoe back on they can have a battle or a debate <laughs> <laughs> town planner versus rossi but um no oh, we appreciate you coming on ross because this is fascinating no, stuff i appreciate right? the invite oh, yeah. mate. i, I have a question about real estate as well but well that's what i was leading into yeah. i wanted to ask 
This is just a general question, Ross, and oh, this is all general in nature, but... For the, for, the, for the listeners out there? Yeah, for the listeners, like, what do you think about the current market conditions? Because Joel and I have spoken a little bit about them at the request of other of our, mm. of our listeners in, in the last couple of podcasts. What do you think about people FOMOing into the market at the moment at all-time highs low, well, and all-time low interest rates? Yeah, it's... The market, I, I just generally find... A lot of people sometimes can be like sheep, um, as in like if everyone's doing it, yeah, it's a good time to be doing it. And then last year, all of a sudden, people weren't wanting to get in the marketplace. And, and sometimes if you had a good secure job and income, like I understand sometimes with like self-employed and people that might have had a decrease of income due to coronavirus can be difficult with sourcing loans last year. But a lot of people, I'd probably say that yeah, the old kind of Warren Buffett be greedy when others are fearful and vice versa. So, mm. um, love that you mentioned that. So, <laughs> we're, we're big on we're big on that one. I love that. Um, no, I always also as well. I think that um, it, it's a good time that as as long as you can afford and if you got your deposit saved, it's like understand that. I guess the market won't be at all time highs because I've got a few friends involved in the new like the Sydney market, and I, I probably I think they're like they've probably just seen it little little level. Like it hasn't come off a lot, but I just gone to the stories where it sold for a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars or more than reserve. I think normally you can see a little just a return back to the normal market of 70, 80 percent clearance rates. Normally when you see offers prior to auction being accepted, um, like I'd probably say in Victoria at the moment, there's not too many auctions that are like having offers accepted prior to auction because they know they can probably maximize the sale price by taking it to auction. But normally that's a sign the market's just returning to normal, like probably coming down from this, you know, what we're seeing is a real strong marketplace. So um, like I don't have a crystal ball, but I think it's going to be, it's it'll probably just return to a little bit more of a, a normal market as far as- If you find a crystal ball, can you share it with Joel and I? Because I want to know. My crystal balls is foggy. <laughs> so. Well, it can't keep going forever. It's one of those things that, you know, and, and we talk about on the podcast a lot, investing is for the medium to long term anyway. Yeah. So if you're, if you're playing a short game, it's always comes with a lot yeah. more risk. But if you're playing a game or you're, you know, you're investing mm. for the longer term, medium to long, three, five, 10 years plus, then, you know, time in the market, will always work well from a compounding factor and allow you mm. to get out with hopefully yep. um, a bit of a gain at the end. Um, and, and, and another, you know, great saying is, you know, um, profits in the buying. So you, if you try to mm. buy well initially, it always yep. sets you up for a better outcome in the longer term. So that's things to just be mindful of. I think when, mm. you know, when there's hysteria or, 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 or FOMO around anything, whether it be stocks or property or mm. Bitcoin or, you know, anything like that, if it, if, you, if it starts to build up in this area, you've always got to try to be mindful to say, okay, well, let's just strip it back and what is it? How's it going to work for me? What's my time frame? And, and work through a few of those numbers there as well. So yeah. I reckon that's a pretty good, that's a really good overview of, um, of this topic. Do you want to ask Rossi anything before we move into our... Um... 50, 50, so anything, anything else, Rossi? Anything we missed? Anything you think the listeners will want to hear or want to know? Uh, can't, to be honest, think of anything else it's going to really touch on. Well, so, well, so uh, they might ask for you back again, mate. They might, they might submit questions. We might get Roscoe on every now and then for a, uh, not, a guest uh, appearance. And also, I guess if we have missed anything and the tankers want to submit a question to ask Ross, yeah. we can take it on notice and then feed them through to him and get an answer back. Like, we'll like through, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, but I think we touched on some really cool stuff today from you know, uh, uh, how to find a builder, how to get a drafty, what council turnaround times are like, feasibility, all those things I think are just at a high level, it's great to for people to understand how it all works. And, you know, if um, if people are interested in that area, I think it'll be some some great tips in there and great gems. So um, we appreciate Roscoe for coming on uh, on to chat and um, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, we got, we'll got keep you around because we, we do a few Q and A's and if you've got anything to add, feel free, mate. But we also yeah. want to hit you with the 50-50s as well this week. Yeah. So. I might go to the first Q&A, Jolie. Yep. So the first Q&A we got this week was from a tanker who wants to remain anonymous and they want a little bit of general information about, uh, so this is this person's over 65 on the age pension and they want a little bit of general information about what they should be doing, I guess, to maximise their wealth creation and preservation at this stage in life. Yeah, it's always a, a challenging one. We deal with that in the planning profession a lot. 
when it comes to retirement and, and age pension or full age pension, we always say if you can have some kind of supplemental income, whether it be an investment in super or something coming in to help top up that age pension, because the age pension in Australia, I think for a single is about 23 and a bit at the moment, um, which is sort of just you know barely on that modest income lifestyle. I think for a modest income, it's, it's generally around high 20s per annum you need to, to live uh, modestly in retirement. So I think things to be mindful of is um, if there's an ability to potentially um, supplement that income with even a casual job, whether it be a shift at Bunnings or you know doing crossing work or, or something to help supplement that income to get you above that age pension and give you that little bit of extra can make a huge drastic difference to someone's lifestyle in retirement. Mm. Um, other things to be thinking of is, well, okay, if I've got minimal savings outside of super, you know, um, and we're in that situation, do I have my home? Is there equity there? Is there potential to be able to use government? There's a government scheme out where you can utilize some equity. Those interest rates are still a bit high and I think there's probably gonna be more things to come from that. I think that's gonna be a big thing of the future is the government's gonna help try to incentivize that for people to be able to use equity from their home through a government scheme rather than using say, uh, a reverse mortgage is another thing. So an equity unlock using a reverse mortgage to create some wealth. Mm -hmm. um, I always say, um, you know, uh, a good saying is, you know, the best time to plan for retirement was yesterday. And if it wasn't yesterday, today. <laughs> so, you know, trying to get in before you get to the age pension to even put something in place to give yourself a bit of a nest egg, even a little bit there to supplement can make a big difference for someone. Yeah, all right, I like that. And you're also mentioning to me that with the age, pen age pension, and it's taxed up to a certain amount and you can earn up to a certain amount before. Yeah, usually, well, all gen always general information on this podcast, never personal in nature, so always seek personal advice or taxation advice. But um, yeah, you can earn around 30000 a year as a retiree in Australia without paying tax. So the age pension, there's a portion of it that's taxable. Um, so you can get a part-time job and still find that you'd be underneath a tax-free threshold. So cool. Thanks, yeah. man. And the second Q&A, which we can all have a stab at if we want, you too, Rossi, if you want, is... um. This comes from John, and they were saying that in the past, Joe and Arnie have talked about dollar cost averaging into investments, specifically in the stock market. Are there any cons, or what are the pros and cons, I guess, of this of this method? So, do you want me to have a stab first, Charlie? Go for it, mate. Or, yeah, all right. So, pros and cons, I think, when I think about this method, what you're trying to do is just bring your cost to the average. So, it's like, it's a low risk way of investing, but I think that can sort of be a pro and a con because if it's a low risk way of investing, then it's also gonna limit the upside, uh, you know, higher risk, higher reward. And what I mean by that is people who are individually picking their stocks as opposed to dollar cost averaging into a stock might get lucky sometimes in towing the market. And I wouldn't advocate for trying because it's, it's impossible, but you know, that's what you're doing there with dollar cost averaging. You're basically lowering your risk. Taking the emotion out of it, like we spoke about before. Yeah, so well, that's, that's another point that you mentioned. So that could be, I guess, a con in one sense is if you are dollar cost averaging and you haven't automated it and you're you're trying to manage it manually you might think the market's really hot or the market's going to drop or, or something and you might psychologically go i'm not going to do my dollar cost averaging this month i'm going to hold it back because i think there's a crash coming and then a crash never comes and you've lost out there and even if you have automated it you might take steps because you think a crash is coming to sell out and then you've done yourself a disservice is that what you're getting at Joel? yeah it comes into play absolutely can you think of any other pros and cons can i just ask you a question arnie back yeah. to dollar cost average i don't have a big knowledge of the stock market but mm -hmm. i understand some basics but how does dollar cost when you're referring to that can you give an example of what dollar yeah cost sure mate is? of course yeah dollar cost averaging so just say you're investing in an index and you had a significant chunk of capital that's coming out of somewhere your options at that point are basically dump it all in at that point, and then you might be trying to time the market, but you don't know what's going to happen. And what a lot of people do to lower the risk, as we were just discussing, is instead of dumping the whole large capital sum in at once, you might drip feed it in. So you might put half of it in mm. straight away, and then you have a set time period. Say you choose 12 months, and you might say, okay, every month I'm going to do another, like one-tenth of the remainder, or sorry, one-twelfth of the remainder. So over the rest mm. of the year, you're going to average in that money into the market and the reason you do that is because it doesn't matter if the market goes up or down, you're going to take advantage of whatever the cost is at that point in time. And therefore yeah. it's going to average your cost out to whatever the average is over time. And if you can yeah. ideally keep contributing those dollar cost average amounts for the same amount in the same time period forever, yeah. then in theory, your cost would always average out to yeah. the average. Mm. Yeah. And you're going to get better spread, better spread of your money. 
um, sequencing risk, and also um, it, it helps with um, uh, that. We spoke about emotions run really hot with markets and mm. people sometimes get very emotional about money and oh, I don't think this month's a good month to put it in. But it could <laughs> yeah. be a bloody great month to put it in. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing you don't know. Dollar well, cost averaging takes that away from, from you if it's, if it's automated. Take the pandemic last year when everything was going blood red in the markets in March. If people were taking their money out right then and there because exactly what you said, they're like, this is going to go worse. And then from there, we've had this incredible rebound all, all stock markets are at all-time highs at the moment. Markets are irrational, very hard to try to predict and make them rational. Yeah, so was that a good enough explanation or did yeah, that? Yeah, that was great, Arnie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But, uh, oh. no, back to when you say a lot of people being emotional in the marketplace, I've seen people with shares checking them like daily or multiple times a day <laughs> and, and I, I don't understand how... To me, that is purely just emotional, and it's almost yeah. like their their emotional state. If they see green next to their shares gone up today by two cents, yeah, that all of a sudden that's yeah. a better day, and and vice versa. I'll actually so. get you in to talk to my clients <laughs> about stop looking at their portfolios way too yeah. often. So yeah. I'm constantly having that conversation <laughs> for any clients listening out there. Don't look at it too much. Let it do its job. It's not going to change, you know, change drastically over three, six, twelve months of. But it's going to change how you feel in the day, yeah. um, you know, if you're watching it daily. So, yeah. mate, that's the, we always talk about sort of separating that. You need to have just put your put your goals in place, set and forget, and then you won't have any emotional distress of checking every day. But yeah, yeah, I always think people make the best like financial investments when they're not emotional about money. Oh, like I sure. always find sometimes that yeah. Yeah, if you have that emotional attachment to money, you sometimes are always making the best decisions with yeah. where to put your money, how to put your money. Yeah, that, you know, yeah. and we, as an advisor, you try to take, we try to take the emotion out of it for clients and we take the emotion for them and become unemotional about making these decisions because we know what's going to be best. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's emotions run hot. And I think I've said it on the podcast before, but literally you can feel a drop in your portfolio three times as much as opposed to an upswing. So it's mm. subconsciously, you know, worked on that. So if your portfolio goes up by 10 grand, but then it goes down by 10, you'll actually feel that three times as much as it's mm. got dropped down 30 grand. I was yeah. laughing to myself when Joel said, it takes the emotion out of it. You're like a financial terminator. It doesn't matter to you, mate. You're just going to achieve the goal. You're just going after it. Yeah. But, um, we actually had, we said in another podcast that a pro of being in property is that you can't check the balance so True. often. Yeah. So it sort of, it it's removes very, that. It's very from... difficult to like get a bank valuation. <laughs> and then there's sometimes cost involved, there's time involved and people will just, yeah, you can't track it on a daily basis. You're and, forced yeah. to be more long-term, aren't you? Yeah. That kind of investment. Yeah. Yeah. And I think short-term property investment can be very um, risky because the cost involved with stamp duty, selling cost, et cetera, it just makes it hard to, so people have a long-term mindset from, I guess, the day they sometimes yeah. invest in property. So. Mm. Great tip. Now onto the most important part of the podcast is our 50-50, what's your choice? Um, I always forget that. E either or. Either or. Yeah. So we, we do this section, Roscoe, if you're, if uh, Rosky, yeah. Rosky's actually not a big podcast listener, but he has listened to, we feel special that you've listened to a couple of hours, but hadn't listened to a lot of podcasts for four hours, had you? No, no, I hadn't been a big podcast listener over my time. Hopefully we got you a convert to a tanker. That's what yeah. we call the listeners. We'll have to get you to talk about your music taste at some stage. Big music buff, Roscoe. Oh, well, that could be a 50-50 topic. Oh, absolutely. But 50-50 or what's your choices. The reason we do it is because in investments, you've got all these different choices in life about what you can do, what not to do. In life, in general life, you've got choices as well. It could be, you know, chocolate in the fridge or chocolate in the pantry. It <laughs> could be a range of different things and sometimes trivial, trivial in nature. Oh, so Joey's going to hit us with a couple of 50-50s today, yeah. but I did tell the listeners I was going to give you the poll results from one I threw up on Facebook during the week, which was chicken twisties versus cheese twisties. Before I give you the official results... Do you mind hint, telling us what you prefer? Surely got to be cheese twisties. Cheese oh, twisties, <laughs> yes. It was me. Yeah. So at the moment, I think we're sitting on around 17 likes and, or loves, and it's 10 for cheese and 7, uh, seven for uh, chickens. But we, we're adding yeah. Roscoe's on to that official total. Chicken so. was making a late run. Yeah. I asked my four-and-a-half-year-old four son before he said chicken. So does that count? Yeah, we can add that on. <laughs> <laughs> so the gap's still three. Chicken's making a late run. But anyway, um, so thanks for all the people voting out there. And, um, and also thanks for the listener submitted 50 50 this week so one of our uh, our listeners our regular friends of the podcast uh Bouch, um is sent through a 50-50 uh, this week so i'm going to throw to the audience um hot dogs skin on or skin off the hot dogs do you want me to go first or roscoe uh, you go, all right i think hot dogs have to be skin off and 
I've eaten hot dogs with skin on before, and I don't like the texture of when you have to bite through the skin, which is what turns me off it. Obviously, once you've done that bite, I feel like it still tastes the same, but it's, an, it's, it's piercing the skin. I don't like it. So I'm a skin off hot dog guy. Yeah, Roscoe? I'd have to say skin on, I think. Skin so on. the texture of the skin doesn't really worry me too much. <laughs> but, uh, so you're happy to take uh, the cheaper per kilo hot dog skin on? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, cost, there's a bit of a difference in cost, isn't there? Oh, to be honest, wouldn't know the cost difference, <laughs> but uh, I'd just probably say you used to skin on the hot skin dogs. On. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I must admit, Thatch actually put a caveat in this, uh, said he thought you, if anyone has skin on, they're a sicko. <laughs> um, I can't remember. I don't really ever differentiate between the two. I don't sort of say, oh, geez, can't wait for this one. It's skin off or, you know, skin on. Ugh. I don't really even pay attention to it, to be honest. It's yes. weird because we were talking to Matty, our producer, about this during the week, and he was saying that he, like, because of throwing back to last week's one was about Bunnings, how do you have your snag with onions oh, underneath or whatever. Yeah. And he was saying that if he has a hot dog, he wants onions and sauce and mustard. And if he has uh, just a snag in bread, he only wants onions and sauce. So it's conditioning, right? And now you're talking about skin on. I'm thinking about if I eat a really nice gourmet sausage, I want the skin on and I enjoy the texture in that sense. I just don't like it with Frankfurt's or hot dogs. So mm. I think I've been conditioned. Yeah, okay. And you're, you'd be frequently frequenting Bunnings as a builder, Roscoe? Yeah. I'd always have, onions? Yeah, always got to have onions and <laughs> sauce. Yeah. Just drench, drench it in sauce, drown it in yeah, sauce. Okay. But, um, and do you like the new RHS thing that Bunnings put the onions underneath? Yeah, yeah. Not, not a big fan of the onion underneath. But, um, <laughs> Someone's complained. Yeah. They burnt their hand, burnt their pinky. Yeah. Um, and the second 50-50 this week is the old adage of uh, Ford versus Holden. Um so uh, that's from Batch as well. Uh, I'll start because I'm not really a car guy, so I must just say I don't really care. Um, just by accident, I think I've owned a few cars over the years and they've been Fords. So my first was an EA with a terrific subwoofer in it um, back when I was 18. Um, and uh, the subwoofer is actually in the back of the seat, which I don't know if it's legal. Um, and then, yeah, I had Ford Territories a couple of times. They were fine, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not a convert either way. Um, Roscoe, you had a great work vehicle back uh, a few years ago. That... Yeah, well, I had, um, my first ever car was a Bombardor actually. So I had a few <laughs> issues with that over the years. But um, since then I had Ford Station Wagon. There's a couple of territories. The Ford station wagon was almost oh. vintage by the end of it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was best 500 bucks ever spent. I think it was 500 bucks <laughs> and a six pack of beer I bought that for. And was, uh, What'd you scrap it for? I got 500 bucks for it. <laughs> <laughs> it only had 200 and, well, it stopped working the odometer at about 285. But it only just got ran in, I reckon. So. <laughs> well, we're going to make it three from three, boys, because I'm a Ford man too. Yeah, and right. full disclosure, I own. Uh, shares of Ford, so uh, <laughs> just pumping it up here. But I also, similar to you, Jolie, I, I, I learned in a Ford, I think it was an EF Falcon, and then an AU after that. AU, yeah. So, and then I, I, my first car that I owned was a Bombardor. Yeah. And uh, it was so shit that it turned me off holding for, yeah. for life. I'll never buy another one. There you go. So we might put that up as a poll for the <laughs> listeners. That would be a, quite a divisive topic, I think. But well, we've got three Fords here. Great yeah. um, financial outcome for Roscoe there. Because oh. usually cars will depreciate straight away when you get them. But Roscoe's is actually well, held I on. I should have held on to it. Because the bloke, it's probably <laughs> worth five or ten grand now. It's, it's starting market. to go up the old EL, yeah, EL yeah. wagon. The used so, car market yeah, is going crazy. So. But um, yeah, some great 50-50s today. So... Um, I think uh, I think we've covered a couple of good ones off. So the listeners again have got uh, lucky. They've got two for one today. So we tend to just be enjoying them so much. We're always just throwing two for ones in. So <laughs> and the throwbacks too. Yeah, so yeah, keep the listener questions coming in for those ones. We love uh, love hearing from the listeners. So thanks for Bouch for those two. Much appreciated. Yeah, and thanks for coming on, Rossi. And yeah, thanks so many guys. If anyone wants to find us, it's at Money in the Tank on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And um, if you could leave a like, a comment, and a subscribe on the YouTube channel, that helps us grow the channel. Yep, and any questions you have, feel free to reach out to us on any of those formats too. Uh, next week, we're hoping to get on. Uh, next week, I believe we'll be getting on is Marty from The Loan Room. Um, so to talk all things finance, uh, equity, uh, mortgages, principal place of residence, mortgages, investment loans. So we'll be able to uh, delve into that one in a bit more detail for the listeners out there and hopefully uh, also add some value um, to everyone's uh, personal finances. Well, thanks for coming on, Roscoe. Yeah. We appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Roscoe. Much appreciated. No all right, crew. Until next week. Money in the tank. We're out. See ya.